Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast. In this podcast, we're going to talk about Mendel's first law, which was the law of segregation. And again, we often call this first law of Mendel. Again, he had no idea this would become his first law. He made these crosses and made some conclusions. And later on, we put these conclusions together and formed this first law of Mendel or the law of segregation. And so let's begin with the definition of a monohybrid cross. Some books will call this a single factor cross, but um, we typically will call this a monohybrid cross. If you ever see single factor cross, it's the same thing. So this is when you have two parents that are different, have different variations for the same trait. So you may take a round plant, we'll use some of Mendel's terms here, round plant, and we cross it with a wrinkle plant. I should be clear, round seed and a wrinkled seed. So this seed here was just really smooth on the outside. This one had um, ridges on it, so it, was less, it wasn't as smooth. So this is monohybrid because we're dealing with the same trait of, of seed shape but different variations. This one's round, this one's wrinkled. So it's a mono for one hybrid cross. So when he did this cross around by wrinkle, what did he see? Well, I imagine before this cross was done, there were a couple predictions. Maybe the progeny would all be round. And a bit of a spoiler alert, this is what they see. But let's talk about the other possibilities that they might have seen. Wrinkle, Maybe for some reason the, the plants, the seeds would have been, had this phenotype of this parent. Maybe you would see both traits. Maybe you would see a, a seed that had some parts of it that were round and smooth and other parts that were wrinkled. Maybe you would see a blend. Maybe when you look at that seed, it's not as round as this one and it's not as wrinkled as this one, somewhere in between. Again, what they, what they did find was that they were round. I'm going to erase this so we can draw this cross out in a different way. So let's draw this cross out. He took a round seeded plant and he crossed it with a rough seeded plant. We call this the P generation. And at the time he did not know that there were two alleles for every gene as we do now. He just reasoned that there was something in there that were split and passed on to the, to the progeny. He didn't know what they were, but we're going to go ahead and state what they are because we know. We're not trying to uh, write a mystery novel here. We might as well just say exactly what we're looking at. When he did this cross, in the next generation, which we call F1, which stands for familial generation, what he saw were three, I'm sorry, four round plants. Then the next cross he did was he took two of these seeds. It didn't matter which two, any of them would have done it. Let's say he took these two and he crossed them together. And remember, they're both round. And what he discovered here in the F2, familial 2 generation, was that he got some round, but some wrinkled. He did this cross 60, 70 times. And each of the times he got this, these numbers here, some were round, some were wrinkled. But again, remember, he loved math. So he counted them. And he discovered that there was about three-fourths of the progeny that produced seeds with rounded seeds. And then there was one-fourth that produced seeds that had this wrinkled appearance. This led to Mendel's first conclusion. So first conclusion of Mendel. And that is F1 plants must somehow, you didn't know how, but that they must inherit genetic factors from both parents. And the reason he has made this conclusion was that if they didn't inherit some of the factors from both parent, parents, in this case little r and big r, then there would have been no way that the little r could have returned. So it seemed reasonable to him that the only way you could get these individuals reforming in F2 was if some of this material from this parent here was passed on to that F1 generation. He also concluded that the only way these numbers work out 
is that the parent must contain two of these characters. And I'm going to put genes, because that's what we're going to call them today. Mendel didn't know the term genes. He called them genetic characters or genetic principles, something on those lines. But he knew it had to have two of these. That's the only way these numbers work out. These observations also led to a second conclusion. That was that the alleles present in one parent, they must separate from each other in the gametes. We now know Mendel was right on target here. This is exactly what happens. That these alleles, both allele copies, must separate from each other during gamete production. And that gametes from male and female must unite. So if he knew this then from these conclusions, then he knew that the original parents had to be, say, something like big R, big R, and little r, little r, and if these were correct, then the progeny here, if you're going to get half from this parent and half from this parent, it must be big R, little r, big R, little r, and big R, little r. And now this leads to his third conclusion. And this third conclusion centers upon these heterozygotes. And this conclusion states that the dominant trait is expressed in F1. And that's why we see round instead of wrinkle. And the recessive traits are somehow masked. They are made to be appear invisible. We don't see them there. We know they're there because they appear again in F2. But here in F1, we don't see them. We don't see the phenotypes of them. So they are masked in F1. Now this fourth conclusion we see evidenced in the F2 generation. So fourth conclusion. And the fourth conclusion stems off of the second one a little bit. It says that the alleles from each parent separate from each other, but not just separate from each other, but they separate with equal probability into the gametes. So for instance, big R, little r, we know that they separate, that 50% of this organism's gametes are going to be big R. The other 50% will be little r. Same with this other parent. Not one or the other genotype is favored. And finally, the, the one that, that is used for fertilization is chosen randomly. And now I want to explain how they led to Mendel's principle of segregation. Remember, this is Mendel's first law. And this, this principle, this law, is made up from his conclusion. So it states that each organism contains two alleles for each trait. Alleles segregate so that each gamete gets one of those alleles. It also states that this allele segregation is random. And that's why we get the numbers we get. Reliably, we get these numbers. Not directly linked to this principle of segregation, he also came up with, which was our third conclusion there, pretty much the same thing, and that is this concept of dominance. This concept of a dominance was, as we said before, only the dominant allele is observed as a phenotype. Any recessive alleles that are there are masked. We don't see them. 
So this is Mendo's principle of segregation. In the next podcast, we're going to talk about Mendo's principle of independent assortment. And these two are very similar in, in one respect, but they're also different. The key for this one is that we're looking at one allele pair. And we'll see with the independent assortment principle that we're looking at multiple allele pairs in that, in that particular principle. Now let's try it up here, Mendel and meiosis. We're going to keep coming back to meiosis every now and then. Now Mendel didn't know anything about meiosis. Nobody knew anything about meiosis. But his results match up nicely with what's happening during meiosis. And meiosis helps explain what's happening. So remember in meiosis, you start off with two homologous chromosomes. And in this case, they maybe carry these genes. Maybe one is big R allele and the other is little r allele. Through meiosis and cell division here, they will begin to copy the DNA. And then through meiosis 1 and 2, each of these cells here will produce two final gametes. And in these gametes, we'll have one that has a chromosome that is big R, one that has a chromosome that is little r, and same thing here. We'll have one that is big R, and another one that is little r. So this explains Mendel's principle of segregation. We have two copies of each allele. These alleles, through the process of meiosis, segregate so that each gamete has one allele. And how they segregate is, is random. That is, which gamete gets the big R, or the little r, is random. So let's talk about Punnett squares. You've probably seen these before, but let's still walk through them. And let's say we're given a problem, and we're asked to predict the phenotypic and genotypic ratios ratios in the following cross. Big D, little d, times big D, little d. To set up this cross using a Punnett square, what you do is recognize, first of all, that these parents, when they make gametes, they're going to make a big D gamete, they're going to make a little d gamete. Same thing with this parent, big D gamete, and a little d gamete. And when we construct our Punnett square, that's what goes on these axes, the gametes. So we have a big D gamete here, and a little d gamete, big D gamete, and then a little d gamete. We then perform the crosses here on the board, so big D and big D, that's going to give us big D, big D embryo. This one's going to give us a big D from this parent and a little d from this parent. We'll give us big D, little d. This parent will get one big D, one little d, because it's getting big D here, little d from this one. And then finally, we've got little d and little d gametes that make the gamete, little d, little d. Now you should look at this Punnett square and make some predictions about the phenotypic ratio and the genotypic. So the genotypic, I'm sorry, the phenotypic ratio is just looking at the phenotypes of the progeny. If big D stands and little d stand for height, and big D is an average height plant, and little d goes towards the uh, recessive trait of being a dwarf plant. So we can look here, we go one big D, little d, one big D, big D, one big D, and then little d. We know that the recessive trait here is big D, and the recessive trait is little d. We can say we have three average plants, two, one dwarf plant. That's our phenotypic ratio. Now our genotypic ratio is similar except we're going to have three categories. We have one big D, big D here. So we'll go one, big D, big D, two. We have 
two heterozygotes, big D, little d. So we'll say we have two big D, little d. And then finally we have one little d, little d. So that's our phenotypic ratio, three average size plants to one dwarf size plants. And then the genotypic ratio says we have one big D, big D, two big D, little d, these two here, and one little d, little d as our predicted phenotypic ratios. So now we want to talk about something called a test cross strain. So let's say you're given a green plant. So you're given a green plant. And you know from various other studies that green is dominant. But we don't know if this green plant is big G, little g, or if it's big G, big G. We don't know what it is, but we want to find out. And the way we find out is by doing a test cross. And so let's do two test cross here. And our strain in question is up here. We know the first one has to be big G, because this one's big G, and that one's big G. But this one, we don't know yet. And whenever, whenever you do a test cross, you always cross your unknown plant to a homozygous recessive. And so if, when you do this cross, you're going to get two big G, little g's because of these here. But what are you going to get in this unknown? Well, if it's equal to a little g, then you're also going to get one little g, little g, and one little g, little g. So in doing a test cross, if it turns out that the strain in question was a big G, little g, then the progeny should give you 50% wild type, phenotypically, and 50% recessive, genotypically, that is. Now, what if, instead of little g, this one that you didn't know about was actually big G? This time when we did the cross, you can see that each of these possible genotypes are heterozygous. So, if in a test cross, your unknown strain is homozygous dominant, such as this, big G, big G, and you do the cross with a test cross strain, you're going to see that each of your four progeny will be wild type. And if you did this a thousand times, you're still going to see this same ratio here, probability. So that's why we use a test cross, to help us determine whether or not a strain is homozygous dominant or heterozygous. All right, that ends this podcast. Just as a brief sum summary, we talked about monohybrid crosses, what they are, what you can predict from them. We talked about Mendel's experiments. In these experiments, we talked about many of his conclusions, but ultimately we came up with his principle of segregation. We then related this principle of segregation back to meiosis. So Mendel plus meiosis. The conclusions he made that supported this principle of segregation can be observed by looking at chromosomes and how chromosomes segregate, which led us into many nice directions, recognizing that perhaps the genes we're interested in are actually on chromosomes and get separated during meiosis. Now remember, he had no idea what meiosis was. And the last thing we talked about were how to use these Punnett squares. And we use these Punnett squares to make predictions. All right, that's all I have for this podcast. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me. I'll see you in class. Bye.